Chris and I had a dream, to drive the entire length of Idaho all on backcountry roads. It would be the most ambitious, arduous, and amazing journey we'd ever attempted. Little did we know the obstacles it would throw in our way, the challenges we'd have to overcome, nor the incredible beauty and hidden stories it would reveal along the way. It would take every last bit of fuel, fire, fixes, friends, and grit to finish this 1,200 miles right up the spine of Idaho in 10 days. This is our dream. This is the Idaho BDR. So what is the Idaho BDR? It's 1,200 miles right up the spine of Idaho, all on dirt roads. Chris, Kate, Elsha, and I spent months planning for this eight to 10 day trip. We had to thread the needle between snow melt and fire season and picked early July as our target date. We had a lot of things working against us on this trip. We didn't know if the roads would be passable. We didn't know fires would erupt along the way. We didn't know if there would be enough gas stations in certain parts, and we'd never driven our rigs this far in one trip. But as intimidated as we were, we still wanted to do it. We're on our way to Jarbidge, Nevada. I'm following Chris down there, and we're gonna meet Rob from Revere Overland down there this this evening at the Red Dog Saloon. So I'm really excited for that. However, while while we still have cell coverage, I've been calling ahead to check the roads and check to make sure that some of these smaller places have gas. So I just called Yellow Pine General Store. They have gas, and uh, they said the roads are good. Um, around Yellow Pine. I then called the Warren, Idaho. It's called the Bomb Shelter. They have gas, they're, they're supplied, and the road between Yellow Pine and Warren is open right now, which is great because there's, that's been questioned. And then I called Elk City, uh, the Elk City General Store, and asked if they had gas, if they had gas, they're all supplied. Um, and then I asked about Magruder, the Magruder Corridor, and, and the person on the phone said she wasn't sure that last she heard there was still six to 12 feet of snow on the Bruder Corridor, which is a little strange. I just saw on Facebook uh, y yesterday that someone had cleared a path. So I don't know what we're going into. It's really nice to get some comforting information from some of these other places, but Magruder is such a huge mystery, such a big piece of the trail that I do not know what we're gonna get when we get there. So we'll see, one step at a time. First, th first step, Jarvis, Nevada, Red Dog Saloon. Ah, yeah. Pulling into Jarbage, we met up with Rob and called our first audible. The Red Dog Saloon is closed in the summer, so instead we climbed up a mountain and found a spot to camp for the night. Yeah, I think this is going to be a good camp spot. Oh wow, that view of the mountain over there is spectacular. Still do. Oh, get out of town. Look at that. We quickly went to work setting up camp, positioning our tents to take a bit of wind, since we were seeing a little bit of weather on the horizon. We came by this campsite by mistake, but felt lucky to have found such an incredible view to kick things off, and decided to enjoy the views while we still could, because we'd find out firsthand later why mountaintops don't always make the best campsites. Day one of the Idaho Backcountry Discovery Route above Jarbridge, Nevada, there's Will Venture to Rome's Jeep Finn. Got Rob busily editing. What are you doing, Will? Make a dinner. Make a dinner. Nice. What are we having? Chimichurri steaks for uh, me and you, you and I, and um, hot dogs for the kids. Oh, because nice. you know what? I think they'll like hot dogs better than chimichurri steak anyway. Well, yeah, they won't uh, get their fine taste established until they're much older. Those little heathens, they get hot dogs. Speaking of, they're the little heathens Move. in Ripley. Buy one of those. Yes, a little heathen. Little you got no here. nothing but a hot dog. <laughs> Just one single hot dog. Please, sir. Can I have some more? <laughs> Please, sir. Here is Rob's sweet new Tundra build. Beautiful blue wrap. And the view from up here is just outstanding. Tonight was the first of many great dinners on this trip. We used Marco from Overland X's chimichurri recipe mixed with some mushrooms and onions to put on top of the steak. Marco, if you're watching this, tip of the hat, buddy. We love your recipes. Watching the clouds move in from our perch was incredible. We thought we might catch a few raindrops and saw a few lightning flashes, but nothing that was headed our way. 
What we did get was a massive moonrise that felt like it was at eye level with us on the mountains. I've never had a moon like that while out camping, and we took it for a good omen that as long as we treaded lightly, someone was looking out for us, a theme we'd see over and over again on this trip. Another omen of things to come was me putting my drone in a tree. Will, yeah. what you doing? I'm trying to uncrash my drone. You need a hand? Nope. Propeller's intact. I don't know. Later that night, I found out why sometimes mountaintops are terrible places to camp. The wind was awful. So it's about 3.30 in the morning, and we're on this beautiful perch on top of a mountain. The wind has been the worst wind I've ever experienced. Lucio Horde is starting to kind of close the tent a little bit. It's not really in the close, but I could kind of feel that thing starting to close. I hope we can get some sleep. I don't know how it's going to affect tomorrow and the start because we've got a long way to go tomorrow. So I'm just going to try and get some sleep if we can. I hope this wind dies down. The next morning we were all groggy but determined to put in the 200 miles plus and finish section one. Chris and I began consulting the Butler BDR map on the first of many reroutes we thought we'd encounter. So we're on section one here, which is about 174 miles. This section I've never done before. So this is just, we, I've been around this, we've all been around this a ton, yeah. but this particular section, I don't know. We're gonna come this way because this is closed. Luckily, our camp was only a few miles outside of Jarbage, but it was really fun to start on top of a mountain before putting in mile one of the Idaho BDR. This area would be really fun to just come explore one of these days. Before we knew it, we were back down the mountain and headed straight into Jarbage, a town that's 100% worth a stop if you're starting a BDR. Jarbage, Nevada, known locally as the most remote town in the lower 48 states, was a gold rush town founded back in 1909 and still has much of its original charm today. We're starting here in Jarbage, Nevada. Jarbage, Nevada is an old mining town that has a ton of history, a ton of charm, and buckets full of authenticity. So where we are right now is the Outdoor Inn. The Outdoor Inn is owned by Jace, who you may have seen in our Jarbage video because he also owns the Red Dog Saloon, which is my favorite saloon that I've ever been to for all time eternity. This is a place that many people start the BDR. A lot of motorcycle groups come and start here because you can stay the night, you can get dinner, you can get breakfast, and you can get a drink at the bar. So let's go take a look. It's a day, I'm hanging in the sunshine. You should hit me with a splash gun. We're about to talk to Jace, who's the owner of this, just to give you a little more insight on how this place runs. I'm Jace, and this is Jane. Hi there. We own the Outdoor Inn and Red Dog Saloon in Jarbeach, Nevada. And uh, we're open from the Memorial Day weekend to the 1st of November, and then from 1st of November to the Wednesday before Memorial Day, everything goes across the street to the Red Dog Saloon. This is the beginning of the Idaho BDR and the end of Nevada's BDR, but we have people do it both directions. This is one of the few places on the BDR route that has 91 octane ethanol free fuel. Right, I did my math wrong. It's $7.86 a gallon. As well as a motel room and a full service bar and restaurant. This is a great place to be. It's uh, unlike any other place in the United States. And a lot of people come here and they're they're amazed. They don't even believe they're in Nevada when they're here. This is also home of the last horse-drawn stagecoach robbery in the United States. And what made it famous is they actually murdered the stage driver. So how does the town of Jarbage feel about so much traffic coming through during summer months? A lot of the people are glad when winter comes, but this is how we make our living. And it's good for people to get out and enjoy the country. I'll tell you what, uh, once you come here once, it's hard not to come back. And part of that's because of you two that you guys have put together these establishments that are so welcoming, they're so authentic. People are coming here and they're staying because of the stuff that you guys have put together. So that's really cool. Well, thank you. Are we ready to go? I'm ready. Chris, don't forget to reset your trip B odometer. Awesome, thanks for the reminder. With full tanks of gas and odometer set to zero, it was time to hit the road. Okay, the Idaho BDR 2022 has now officially begun, fellas. Here we go. I feel like this is the point where I should say something inspirational. Something inspirational. Those are profound words, Rob. So we've 
start of the BDR, we're driving down Jarbage Canyon. You know, I know this road, which is odd. I feel like we haven't started the BDR yet because I know the road and I really expect the BDR to be places that I haven't seen before. And so I'm just really anxious and interested to get to those parts that I haven't driven on yet and haven't seen. So in the meantime, I'm just enjoying a familiar road and a beautiful desert uh, canyon. It wasn't long until we climbed out of the canyon and hit the Bruno Desert. This would be one of the straightest and fastest sections of the entire BDR. Our plan was to speed through this stretch and then stop in Glen's Ferry for lunch and gas before continuing on. We are making our way through the Bruno Desert here on our way to Glen's Ferry. And these roads are just long and straight. We are just trying to uh, put some miles in right now. There's not really anything to see out here, but there is a beauty to the desert. The desert is a beautiful place if you look at it. And we've had so much uh, moisture this year. This desert is more green than I've ever seen before. I mean, it's still a desert, but it's green just makes me uh, admire the, the folks who actually made a life out here. Native Americans and the homesteaders and ranchers. It's a hard life out here, but, um, but they did it and they thrived. As the day wore on, the heat of the desert got intense. One of the reasons we wanted to speed through this section as fast as possible. When Carson said it is of 103 degrees outside. Oh man, mine too. That is brutal. I just had to turn my cooled seat down a little bit because I was getting a little too chilly. <laughs> Super barren landscape, but it's uh, but it's still part of Idaho, just like you. I think what he's trying to say is Idaho. With just a few miles of pavement, we hit Glen's Ferry for lunch. So what is this place? Uh, it's a little restaurant called The Stop. It's like you know, Glen's Ferry's version of like a McDonald's or something. So, but it's been here ever since I was a kid, and they had great food and great shakes and stuff like that. So let's see if it's still as good as I remember. The stop was a surprise hit. Great burgers and shakes for the kids and a walk down memory lane for Chris. So Chris, you're from Glen's Ferry. It was a lot of fun growing up here. Rode our bikes everywhere, ride our bikes to school, um, go down to the Snake River. And it was, I don't know, it was just like a fun place to grow up. Well, this is like our last kind of major point of civilization for a while. Yeah, definitely. So, mirrors, yeah. Heading north and heading into the forest. Hopefully cooling off. Hopefully cool enough, yeah. For a moment there, we hit 111 degrees. I just looked at the weather forecast for this place for the rest of the week, and it's basically 104 and 105 degrees. So far, we've had nothing but really easy dirt roads, like pristine dirt roads, like graded and compacted. Any rig could do what we've done so far. I mean, two-wheel drive, minivan, anything could do what we've done so far. So. I think we're going to see some more challenging stuff, but so far it's been easy ride. This is the first section so far that I'm relatively unfamiliar with. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been out like in this direction myself either. Looks like we might have a little precip up here. It looks like we've got a little bit of rain ahead. I'm seeing some precipitation, some rain, maybe some thunder clouds, which happens on these hot, hot days. The rain I would not mind at all. The thunder and lightning I could do without, but then I can see the mountains. We're getting there, at least the beginning of them. And now wait to get up there and get out of this heat. This was such a strange part of the BDR. The roads went back and forth between dirt and pavement, and the terrain was really in between two climate types. And whenever we hit dirt, the dryness of the desert made for crazy dust trails. Hey, did anybody order some dust? No, I specifically put on there, no dust. I'll take half dust, please, just half dust. I think this little climb right here is where that, in uh, the BDR movies, where that guy got hurt and they came to get him. Oh yeah, that curve looks familiar. I think it was right in there, wasn't it? If you haven't seen the Idaho BDR film made by Sterling Norin and the BDR organization, you should definitely give it a watch. To say it was inspired by Sterling is an understatement. He filmed this thing on a camcorder and a bike and made an excellent film. Lucky for us, we have a bunch of gear to help us film this trip and Rob and I shared footage, so I'm hoping we can do it justice, which is no easy feat since Idaho is massive, rugged, and hard to pin down. Gained a bit of an uh, elevation. We're at about 
4,800 feet right now. So things are just a little bit greener, a little bit cooler. So cooling up, heading the right direction, getting greener. And it's really fun to see the landscape begin to change. Looks like we're not too far away from Anderson Reservoir, maybe five, five to 10 miles. My first big surprise of this trip was the beauty of Anderson Dam, which is on the south fork of the Boise River. I've never approached the dam this way. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's pretty damn cool. You're pretty damn cool. As we wound our way along the reservoir, we approached our first detour in the BDR. This was calculated on our part. We knew we were threading the needle between snowmelt and fire season, so in an effort to be in northern Idaho earlier in the month, we accepted this detour. And I had a route and camping spot in my back pocket that I hoped the group would like, but it was tough to give up Trinity Mountain. It's so beautiful! I love these mountains, man. I love the Trinities. I wish we could go up there. It is so spectacular. So now we're headed to Pine, probably gonna get some gas because we won't have another stop for gas for a long time after that. And then head up uh, to James Creek Summit because we cannot come up to Trinity Mountain. Uh, the road is closed for four-wheeled vehicles until July 15th, and today is July 13th. So we're gonna detour around up through Rocky Bar, Idaho, and, um, and James Creek Summit and uh, Atlanta, Idaho, and then double back down the Boise River and connect back to the BDR route. As a local overlander, I know this part of Idaho well. So this detour was a pretty safe bet, something that wouldn't be the case later in the trip. The road to Rocky Bar and then to Atlanta, Idaho is a great way to put yourself into some of central Idaho's most beautiful mountains. The windy, twisty road gives you new views after every turn and is maintained enough to be accessible by most vehicles. However, it's kind of way out there, so we were happy to have the road all to ourselves. One of the many seemingly random markers on the BDR tells the story of what pioneer life was like back in the 1880s. And this little monument is too interesting to pass up. So we stopped to pay homage to Peg Leg Annie. So this is the monument to Peg Leg Annie and her friend Dutch M, who were making the trek from Rocky Bar to Atlanta and got caught in a flash winter storm up here in the mountains where there is no help. And Peg Leg Annie lost both of her feet and her friend, um, Dutch M didn't survive. But this monument isn't just because the tragedy happened. It's really to commemorate and honor the pioneer women of the time. And so whenever we drive by, we want to stop and just give some good vibes to Peg Leg and to Dutch M. It was now late in the day and we were all ready to be done, ready for an easy night. That's gorgeous. Oh wow. You can already tell that this is going to be a pretty campsite. As we pulled into our home for the night, tucked away in the Idaho mountains, I had a feeling of disappointment that we weren't staying on the actual BDR. But I was equally grateful that there are so many world-class options for camping and exploring right here in Idaho. This is night two of the Idaho BDR. We left from Jarbridge this morning, and now we're um, at the James Creek Summit. As we started in on the work of setting up camp, I quickly forgot all about Trinity Mountain. We lucky few had this mountain all to ourselves. Just me, Chris, Rob, and the kids, who by now have learned to pitch in and help. After brushing off some of the dust from the trail, we finished setting up camp and tried to soak it all in. This was just the beginning. Today we started on a windy mountaintop in Nevada, drove about 220 miles, and saw firsthand how Idaho changes from the high hot desert to the cool forested mountains. 
We really thought we'd accomplish something today, and that the days would get easier and shorter from here. Little did we know just how wrong we would be about almost everything, and that we need every second of sleep for the grueling days ahead, and that we'd all be changed forever by the backcountry of Idaho. It was the morning of day three on the Idaho BDR, and we were feeling refreshed and ready to dive into a day that would take us deeper into the unknown parts of Idaho. So we started breaking down camp, imagining all the adventures that were coming our way. Hey, feeling good, like I should. When in Durku, walk around the neighborhood. Feeling blessed, never stressed. Got the sunshine on my Sunday bed. Our plan now is to follow the Boise River back to the BDR route, mm -hmm. um, and then from there we'll cut through the mountains to Loman. Um, and then from Loman, we're hoping to get to Deadwood. That section is about 150 miles. Rob from Revere Overland is on this trip with us, and um, just want to check in, dude. How's the trip for you so far? It's been great. I love seeing Idaho. Uh, you know, I've only been here, I've been here twice before, and it's just in the same one spot each time, so it's great seeing some different parts. Love going across the desert. I know you said it was a bit of a slog for you, but something completely new for me. Ready to roll? Ready to roll out! James Creek Summit is only a few miles from Middle Fork of the Boise River, which is literally my stomping ground. The drive down was easy, so we tried to make up a bit of time since we were essentially backtracking to reconnect with the main PDR route. I just do work, use the word lovely one more time. This drive is lovely. Lovely. We have made it down from James Creek Summit. Um, now we're driving along the Boise River, and it is just so beautiful right now. The, the road is kind of like a sandy white. The river is just beautiful running down. As we make our way, back toward the BDR and trying to get over to Loman before cutting over to Deadwood. So I'm feeling high spirits, I'm feeling optimistic. I, this is our second true day, so I'm still riding high in the fact that we're doing this. But I'm still in places that I know. This is like a Sunday drive for me, driving along the Boise River, because it's just like right outside my house. Um, but it's still beautiful every time. I'm still amazed by the beauty of this river and how close we live to it, how close we live to like all this beautiful public land. So just having a good time driving steps. So we have just rejoined the BDR and man what a beautiful part of the Boise River this is. It flattens out, it gets nice and wide and it's just gorgeous to look at. So we'll get off the Boise River here in just a minute and start crossing over the mountain ranges. Chris, we're 240 miles in, only, yeah, like 960 more to go. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, uh, maybe I will go the other direction. They say ignorance is bliss, and because of that, this was the most enjoyable part of the day. We were free from the worries of distance, gas, and time. We thought we were ahead of schedule and leaned into a little sightseeing along the way. Yeah, we're gonna go up to that spot, past that spot where I did the, um, the Dark Secret video. Yeah, the really cool overlook. Yeah, we should stop there just for a sec. Yeah, it's a pretty epic view. So we stopped at this lookout. That's one of my favorite lookouts in the Boise area. It's this plateau that overlooks Steel Mountain, Rattlesnake Mountain, and you can just kind of see the beautiful ranges that are around Boise. And so we're just here for a quick stop, quick look before we cross over the rest of the mountains and uh, make our way to the North Fork of the Boise River, and then to Loman, and then to Deadwood. So Rob, just real quick, what do you think about this uh, trip so far today? Oh, it's awesome. I loved heading along the river valley. Yeah, it's beautiful, but we've come up here and you got to one of those spots I guess Idaho is well known for. We've just got 
you know, mountain chains, views off in every direction. I love it. Hey, well, thanks for sharing the spot. Man, I love finding spots like this because you wouldn't see them from down there. You can't see them from down on the main road. You have to be going from one place to another. And it's like the one spot that's in between and that in between spot gives you this incredible view. So I'm happy to share it. It's all of ours. We just found it. So it's really fun to stop here on the way to, to the North Park. We said goodbye to the middle fork of the Boise River and headed down the hills to the north fork of the Boise River, which was just as beautiful. We felt invincible, like nothing could slow us down. We were almost in cruise control. We then cut north to the mountains and ran into the first of many issues we'd face in the next 18 hours. Well, we've reached a fork in the road. We've, we've reached our first road closed sign. I bet you people are doing this because I see lots and lots and lots of tracks coming by. Whatever this was happened back in 2019. And sometimes it takes the Forest Service like 10 years to fix a road. So it could be fixed and they just haven't updated it. But I doubt that. If they have officially fixed it, they'll issue a new order and they'll take the sign away. Detour? I think what we're going to do is backtrack to the highway and take the highway into Loman instead of these dirt roads. Now there is a place where we could take the highway for a little bit and get back to dirt. But honestly, I told the kids they're going to get to go swimming at Deadwood Reservoir. And that's really important actually. I want to, I want to make good on that promise to them. So we're going to have to detour no matter what. And, and what we're going to do is we're just going to stay on the highway until we get to Loman and then we'll get back on dirt and, uh, Cross the mountain range over to Deadwood. So I'm a little disappointed that we hit our first road close sign. I'm not convinced this is going to be our last one, uh, but this one's for the kids. So we're going to go easy on it. So we backtracked a bit, hit the highway, and wound our way into Loman, where we'd make one of the most critical stops of the entire trip. Well, did you want to get gas? I'd like to get a couple more gallons. Ouch, 707 a gallon. Little did we know, picking up gas in Loman, Idaho, would be one of the smartest decisions we made. More on that later. We were now heading into some of the more forgotten parts of Idaho, on our way to Deadwood Reservoir. Lots of locals know about Deadwood, but no one gets there on the roads that we were about to take. So we are climbing our way over this first ridge, and what I love is that this road really hasn't been driven a lot. It's clear that it's kind of a low, used road. It's super windy, super narrow, so you have to be really, really careful, but it's not treacherous unless you're not paying attention. Like if, like if you're like recording a video or something like that. That's the range to the left there that we're crossing to get to Deadwood. That's pretty. Well, Chris, this is uh, this is kind of what I was hoping for on this on this trip, man. What about you? Yeah, definitely. We were now hitting the parts of the route that I had been longing for. The in-between places no one else ventures to roam. For the first time, I felt like we were truly alone out there in the best possible way. roads were rough enough to make the driving slow, but it also gave us the time to soak it all in. Water crossing. Astro, no. I'm gonna go switch to low. I'm gonna keep going. What you know about rolling down in the deep when you It's uh, 4.30 already. I was hoping to be at camp at 4, so we're not really close to camp yet. So I'm trying to make up a little, a little bit of time by pushing pace on this road so we can get the kids in the water and have them have a nice, fun afternoon. Dad. 
Deadwood Reservoir is a central Idaho gem of a place. Located just a few ridges back from Highway 55, this reservoir was completed in 1931 and pools the confluence of the Deadwood River and the South Fork of the Payette. So we made it to camp at Deadwood Reservoir, which is a beautiful reservoir, reservoir up in the central mountains of Idaho. And uh, I will say that it's a popular place. It's kind of overrun with people. It's buggy, which is kind of why I have my collar up. And this is uh, not my favorite campsite. That being said, the lake is beautiful. The kids have been down to swim. And uh, right now, I am just making dinner. What we're having tonight is called egg roll in a bowl. It's essentially ground pork, cabbage, onion, peppers, cooked in a kind of a, I would say like an Asian sauce of some sort. I'm gonna do a little Kung Pao sauce tonight. Over here, we're just cooking down the cabbage in the pork fat. As soon as it's cooked down just a little bit, we'll add it into the stock pot and we'll mix it all together and have a delicious meal. Nothing goes with a good meal cooked at camp like a killer sunset, and that's exactly what we got. Turns out there's a reason Deadwood is popular. It's stunning. With our bellies full of good food, we watched the sunset, made a fire, and realized, in the grand scheme of things, this was pretty great. Okay, it's day three of our Idaho backcountry discovery route journey. We're leaving from Deadwood today. We're going to Yellow Pine. We're entering into parts of Idaho that I've never been to before. Kate and Elsha and my father and mother-in-law are gonna join us on the trail, so we're gonna have some more people with us, which will be a lot of fun. And so we're, uh, we're just about ready to close doors, start engines, and roll out. We were happy to put Deadwood in our rearview mirror, and after three long days of driving, we thought today would be easy. So far, it was shaping up to be just that. I'm gonna pick up the pace to like uh, 40, 40, 50 miles an hour, because this is just so easy. So, we're on our way to Yellow Pine, and the roads are beautiful, flat, straight, we're making a really good time. Just enjoying Tyndall Meadows, which is this beautiful meadow just in the middle of nowhere, just in the middle of a couple mountain ranges. There's flowers in the meadow, there's a like a stream running through it it's super green and uh it's just beautiful what a beautiful day i'm in good spirits today hoping to uh, make good time in the alpine Man, this is beautiful. it wasn't long before we came across a warning sign which turned out to have a double meaning for me as i'd never been beyond that point in the road before rough road doesn't look rough okay we have reached a point in the road that i have i've never been this far north um, in this area before, so I'm super excited. We have come up from Deadwood to roughly the Warm Lake area. There's a cutoff that takes you to Warm Lake, which is just east of Cascade, Idaho. So from here, it's about 26 miles north, almost directly north to Yellow Pine. Um, and I assumed this road was gonna be more of the same flat, open, easy drive. We got a couple signs here saying it's a rough road. So we'll see how it goes, but I cannot wait to drive this road. I've never been before, and we're going to Yellow Pine. Yeah, it definitely was not a rough road. The sign was a joke, at least for the road conditions. They were fantastic. I probably should have taken heed of the deeper meaning, though, of being careful while venturing into the unknown. But I was like a puppy in a field, enamored with everything I came across. So this is a pole for the snowplow, so they can see the road. And it's up that high because they get so much snow in here during the winter that everything else would be buried. So they attach this tree to it and put a marker on top. So that is a lot of snow in the winter. We were all in four high, which was a good thing for traction on the road, but bad for fuel consumption. However, I knew because I called ahead, we could fill up our tanks in Yellow Pine, a place that threw us our first major curveball of the trip and prove that no matter what, you don't know what you don't know. And we didn't know Yellow Pine. Yellow Pine, Idaho is not a town. It's an unincorporated inholding with public land surrounding it. 
This community of private land was founded by a telegraph operator named Albert Bean back in 1906 and was a central trading depot for the mining towns that popped up close by during the early 1900s. It remains a place of last refuge for these parts of Idaho and feels very much like a pioneer town, even though it's not a town. We were eager to get gas here, and it's also where we met up with the rest of our convoy. Kate and Elsha arrived in Elsha's new Gladiator, and my parents-in-law Jim and Carla arrived in their two-door JK. Four Jeeps and a Tundra. We were really excited to see everyone and to have met up off-grid like this. However, we also got some news from the general store and gas station that dramatically changed our outlook for the trip. So we're here in Yellow Pine, and um, we just found out that they're rationing gas. They were supposed to get a gas shipment and it didn't arrive, so they're down to 150 gallons for the whole town, so no one can buy more than two gallons. I called ahead on Tuesday before we left to ask if I had enough gas. They said yes, but then their shipment of gas didn't arrive. Uh, I have about 100 miles, I think, of range left in the Jeep. Plus we've got Jim and Carla and Elsha and her Gladiator. I don't know how much gas they have. We've got to get to Warren tomorrow to get more gas. Warren is about 60 miles, but it is over. We're crossing a 9,000 foot peak and who knows what we're gonna run into. So I'm hopeful that I have enough gas. I don't have a lot of room for error, um, but I'm gonna get my two gallons. I'm gonna be happy about my two gallons. I'm gonna try to get to Warren. With my two gallons and two untested rigs, for some reason it seemed like a good idea to climb up the side of a mountain next to Yellow Pine. I mean, the trail to get up there was only three miles long. Sure, it zigzagged up the side, but it looked fine on the map and we probably have a great view. Should be easy. Famous last words. Rob, I think we should go up the mountain. To be fair, I asked the folks at the gas station if the trail was okay, and they said, sure, go for it. You can totally camp out there. In hindsight, they may have been wagging my tail a bit, but hindsight is 2020. There's a switchback up here that's really tight. The trail was a series of switchbacks that clearly hadn't been driven by a full-size rig all year long. In some ways, it was a great first trail for Elsha's Gladiator and Jim and Carla's JK, but we were climbing up about 3,000 feet, and the road got worse and narrower as we got higher. Oh, mama, just a little bit of pucker factor on this ledge. We were moving at a snail's pace, and because of that, we were also losing daylight. So I went I had to scout the end of the trail. Forging ahead to kind of scout what's up here. Along the way, I did my best to clear as many obstacles for the group as I could, including a boulder in the middle of the road. But I came across a few things that I needed some help with. So now there's super tight squeeze with logs. I'm gonna try to widen it. Uh, it's almost pinching the blade. Yeah. I'm not sure what to do here. I try to cut a wedge in it. So what do you think? What should we do here? Um, it's, this is a solvable problem. It is. Hold on. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, just just the deering. Oh, just the deering. We get the chainsaw. With all the obstacles clear, we forged ahead. With over three hours into this trail, I was regretting making the call to bring everyone up. And I hoped at least we'd find something that would be worth the climb. I bet we've already burned those two gallons. Yes, yeah, definitely. Whew, so we're driving up this, this road up the mountain for a camp spot tonight. And it's more technical than we thought, but it's not so technical that we can't do it. I do think it's challenging some of the newer rigs they don't have bigger tires and big suspension on them. That's the Gladiator um, and uh, Jim and Carla's two-door Jeep. Uh, Rob's also really wide on this trail. I just went back and uh, cut some wood with my chainsaw to get it off the road, just to widen it up a little bit for him. But the trail is it's just an old, just an old unused road. So there's nothing that really makes it super technical or difficult. It's just really, really rough. So we're about to get up the top of this thing. And here's hoping that it's worth the drive to get up there for a good campsite tonight. Looks like there's a mine up here. What we found was an old mining site. It had beautiful views, but was very uneven. That said, we were tired, our nerves were frayed, and we were hungry, so we just decided to call it and set up home for the evening. So we're not just trying to pose for Instagram. We actually needed to get the rigs on that high of a stack of rocks just to level them out. There's, there's my rig. There's Chris's rig. This is just so we can sleep tonight. And let me show you Rob's rig. Rob's is just as bad. 
it's pretty safe to say where we're camping is not level. Here's Rob's rig. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous, but the good news is we got everything level. So the end of section two on the BDR ended here above Yellow Pine on this mountain. And even though the trail wasn't what we thought it was and the campsite is less than great, we're all getting along. People have never met before. Am I distracting you? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. So to. We're getting along and we're having dinner and we're reliving the trail up here and telling stories and getting to know each other. And it's just, uh, it's just makes, makes my heart warm to know that when you go out with good people, good things happen. We had used all of our new gas climbing this mountain and didn't have a way to refill our tanks. We had serious miles before the next gas stop and I'd put the entire trip in jeopardy by leading the group up here. But all of these problems, as scary as they were, would have to wait until tomorrow. So the sun has set, so campfire conversations have begun. It's nights like these, when people are sitting around just talking shop, telling stories, uh, it just make me love being out here. And you know, this <clears throat> Idaho backcountry discovery route is really an excuse to do that. It's an excuse to get out, disconnect, see things in the backcountry that most people don't get to see, and just connect with each other. So this group is becoming kind of a team right now, and it's really fun to see that happen. But we're going to sit around the campfire for a little longer and go to bed with full hearts. Morning came just a bit too early and brought with it the problems from the day before. With five rigs at camp, it always takes a bit longer to get on the trail, so we use some of the extra time to come up with a game plan for the day. Packing up this morning and trying to figure out what we're gonna do next. It was suggested that we go back into McCall where Kate's parents have a cabin, maybe drop the kids and everybody off and just the three of us continue. But people wanna do the trail. So I think what we're gonna do is stay on the trail, figure out the gas situation, um, and try to make our way to Bergdorf, which is probably 80 to 100 miles. So I do not know what we're going to get into today. Oh my gosh, Kate, it is so good to see you on the trail. How's it been so far? It's been good. It was fun. I was in the Gladiator with Elsha, and we got to do some pretty technical driving. I got to do some navigating and helping her kind of on the trail. So it was, yeah, it was good. It was fun. Well, you're going to be doing driving today because we're going to be swapping drivers in the rigs I'm ready. a lot. Let's do it. All right. Well, we're about to pack up and go. What do you say? Let's do it. Okay. Because we'd already cleared the trail, the way down was easy and we made quick work of getting to the bottom. So that was called Golden Gate Mountain, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Okay, I'm down. Mine says 44 miles, LMP. Mine just says low fuel. So, uh, next stop, maybe we can see if we can get some gas. We're back at Yellow Pine. My gas said low fuel coming down the mountain, and as we got kind of on level ground, it started saying I had about 50 miles left. It's about 60 miles to Warren, I think. I've got an extra four gallons on either side of the of the Jeep in um, hinge mount Rotapax, but I talked him into selling me four gallons. It was rationed to two gallons a person. He sold me four, don't tell anybody. It's amazing how much confidence an extra two gallons of gas gives you, and I was feeling every ounce of it. So I'm probably gonna drive, uh, my pace will be somewhere around 25, 35 miles an hour. This road's in really good shape. Wow, this is a beautiful area. I've just never seen that much bear grass in bloom in one place in my entire life. We were headed towards what's called the Profile Gap, which is the gateway to Elk Summit. But instead of being out of gas, we were just hungry. So we found a nice shady spot to pull over and grab a bite, give the kids PBJs, and receive a very particular gift from Rob. My good buddy Rob from Revere Overland gave me this. This is for you. What is this? Well, motto. Motto juice. And uh, I think his recent trip to Canada has um, made him kind of a worldwide traveler and opened him up to new things. You gotta tell me what's in this first. Tomato juice, which is clam juice and tomato juice mixed together. Tomato and clam. Clam. And I told him I'd take a drink. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. like um, clams and tomato and celery. That is not a good combination. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a rob and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go 
politely put this down on the tailgate table. Without anyone noticing, I quietly put it down on the tailgate and started dinner. Okay, how about I jump in your rig, Kate jumps in Finn, and you have a drone session. Sounds like a plan. So, in order to keep the group moving and get like the best shots, we're kind of switching up drivers so one of us can be full-time flying a drone while the other one's driving. That means I get to drive, I get to drive Rob's blue Tundra while he, while he pilots the drone this time. So pretty excited for that. The uh, verdict I'm driving the Tundra. Really comfortable. It's extremely luxurious. So I get it. I get it. And yes. So I'm driving Rob's rig right now. This thing is like so luxurious. Look at this screen. It's like 27 inches big. At least that's what it feels like compared to my little tiny five inch screen. Emerson better check out that uh, fire truck. Wait, what? Got some uh, overhead obstacles here. Hey Will, is Rob gonna be able to get underneath us? I don't think Rob's any taller than we are. Slow, whoop, that's okay. That was just a small, that was a small branch. As we made our way towards Elk Summit, we faced our first major unknown aspect of the trail, snow. It was hard to believe there still might be snow in July, but until you get up there, there's no real way to know. We are just skirting the edge of the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. I think uh, we're gonna cross Elk Summit, which is about 9,000 feet or so. We're a little worried about snow. We don't know if there's gonna be snow up there. We've heard both. I've called to check with different, um, different sources. Some of them have said, there's no snow, it's okay. Some of them have said uh, there's 12 feet of snow up there, so I don't know what to expect. Um, I have about a 100 mile range so far on my Jeep with, with a little bit of extra gas on the sides. So I'm, I'm uh, optimistic that I have enough to get to Warren and refuel. Um, and Rob also has an extra 10 gallons and I think Chris has an extra two gallons. And so right now, I'm just uh, just going to focus on driving up and over this pass and see what awaits us at the top. While Elk Summit isn't the tallest mountain in Idaho by a long shot, it's the tallest mountain on the BDR. And depending on winter snowpack and summer temps, it can have snow well into July. We knew we were threading the needle with the time window we chose, but as Idaho natives, we have the luxury of being here and watching the temps all year long. So while we were uncertain of what we'd find at the top, I had a good feeling about making it through. We're going to hit a little snow bank here, uh, my friends. You look basketball case? Uh, yes, I'm just going to put it in four high, uh, I think. Looking good, Kate. I'd definitely put a tire on the left and uh, no problem. So I won't say anything about Kate being able to drive Finn through a snow bank without getting stuck. What Elsha was referring to is a trip a few years back to Hell's Canyon where I got Finn stuck in a very similar looking snowbank. It was a great joke on her part, but it also re-emphasizes the fact that spring snowbanks, as small as they might look, can be really hard to get through. Lucky for us, Kate blazed the great trail and everyone slipped through no problem. The Elk Summit question had now been answered. And these roads are beautiful. It feels private, it feels secluded, and it feels old. Like Old forest, old mountain. I know they're all old, but it just feels a little bit different here. Even though we were all in awe of the beauty around us, we had to admit our time was running out. We go over a gorgeous little waterfall. Oh yeah, that is gorgeous. So I think we should consider just driving to Schieffer Campground, just because it's getting so late. Even if we got to Warren, the gas stations are probably gonna be closed. How far are we from Warren time-wise? Hour and a half, two hours, I think. From Warren? I mean, we're traveling at about 15 miles an hour on average, it's probably 15 miles from here. Okay, well let's go to this campground and let's stop and huddle. The campground we found was right on the south fork of the Salmon River. I do you believe this campground is all ours and nobody's there? That is what I like to hear. The shadows were getting long as we pulled into this deserted campground. 
It had been another long day on the trail, and the group had become closer because of it. The river offered us nature's perfect white noise to calm our nerves and settle us down. It also offered some of us a chance to cool off in the water. Elsha, your hair looks wet. Slightly damp, yes. Well, how, how did that happen? Uh, well, I jumped in a river. Oh, you brought your swimsuit? Not exactly, no. Oh, it, was, it was more of a, it was a kind of suit. It, some people call it a birthday suit. <laughs> Well, I, that's, where's my camera when I need it? Although I hear that maybe it's on the drone footage. You know, that's, that's going to be up to Rob. That's all I got to say. <laughs> you better be nice to him. I know, I do. <laughs> so, well, I got to ask, oh. why, why are you uh, having to soak your rather swollen and purple ankle? Well, that's an easy story. I was trying to remove a branch. This is the question we ask ourselves. Why? What is Will doing? And mm -hmm. it was just too high for me, so I thought I could like uh, jump off of my bumper, grab the branch, and land like a ninja. And I landed like uh, not a ninja. I landed like a will. <laughs> I rolled my ankle, and I've been hobbling around today. And I'm sick of this cold water, and it feels so good. And this is why I keep you know multiple ace wraps in my uh, first aid kit, just for will. Yep. That and, and lots of actine. You need spam, an extra can of spam for M and an extra ace wrap for Will. Exactly, there we go. It's all, it's all about just being prepared. After cooling off, I emptied my extra gas into the tank so I'd have enough range for the trek in the morning. Then I started the work of setting up camp while the kids played and Elsha went about making dinner that was an incredible invention of Pad Ki Mao, which was her take on a Thai dish made of sauteed chicken and vegetables then served with zucchini noodles. What do you think, Adela? Oh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Adela. And Miss May, your plate's already clean. All right, Em, how do you like it? Thumb up. And hey, thank you so much, sir, for helping make the zoodles. I appreciate it. Elsa, right. so good. I uh, want the recipe and the zoodle maker. Awesome. Christmas. I don't think you can underestimate the amount of gratitude you should have for a great cook at camp. It really made the evening feel perfect. And while tomorrow was still a puzzle we'd have to solve, we let the river keep us in the present as we called it an early night in the backcountry of Idaho. Thirty this morning, and we're getting up early because we're gonna to try to make a push to get Kate to McCall. You ready to go back to work? I'm <laughs> sad you have to leave. So our problem is that the real world calls for some people in our party today. They came out for a weekend on the BDR with us. We need to get them home because they have things that they have to do. So we did not make it to Bird Grove like we planned. We stopped here. There's a beautiful spot on the river with no mosquitoes, which is amazing. And, um, and now we've got to make some time. So we all agreed to get up early, to get out early, and get Kate back to McCall as quickly as possible. Today, the group gets a little bit smaller. So for the next three days, it's just gonna be myself, Chris, and Rob, which means I think we can move a little bit faster and maybe make some of this time up, but we just don't know what lies ahead. I've been surprised by how grueling this is. And for now, I'm just gonna keep having this delicious cup of coffee and getting ready so I don't sell the group down this morning. The air was cool and damp as we hit the trail early, which is how I actually prefer to overland. And even though we were a little groggy, the trail immediately offered us incredible scenery to help our senses wake up for the day. At first, our minds were focused on getting to McCall on time. But as the morning drive continued, we were completely overtaken by the beauty of the Idaho mountains.
great condition, and we were making good time on our way to Warren. As we climbed away from the South Fork of the Salmon and passed through the shadows of China Mountain, we had a sense of relief and sadness. Relief because we knew we'd have enough gas to make it to Warren, and the trails hadn't thrown us any roadblocks. And sadness because we knew after we hit Warren, our little team would be splitting up soon. Hey, Elsh, how's Ripley doing on gas? Uh, she's holding strong at a quarter of a tank. That uh, should be plenty. Warren is another unincorporated community in the north central Idaho mountains. This is a place that feels like it doesn't need to or want to be found. Okay, I think we're just going to roll out. The community here felt very tight knit and indifferent to our convoy as we passed through. It's a neat place to see and a place you can get gas if needed, but we pressed on as we were still trying to make up time to get folks to McCall. Rob, we're not in England anymore. We drive on the right side of the road here. Warren is also the point in the trail where you feel yourself getting a little closer to civilization as the roads are wider, flatter, and the terrain is steady. We hit pavement and beeline for McCall before backtracking to the BDR route with a much smaller group of travelers. So we are back on the BDR. We took a brief hiatus to run into the town of... McCall, where Kate's parents have a cabin there, we were just there for like a few hours. We went to the grocery store and restocked, so it kind of feels like we're starting all over again. We even like sprayed the rigs down. Hey Rob, that's a car wash, not a shoe wash. We dropped off Kate and the kids, we dropped off Elsh and the kids, and Kate's parents also um, have left us on the trail. So that means that it's just Rob, Chris, and myself from here on out. So um, we're about to uh, tear through this dirt road, get to Bergdorf, so we're heading north. We're making our way towards Elk City. I don't know how far we're gonna get because it's about 3.30 in the afternoon. So let's get started. Finding our way through uh, this mountain pass and somewhere down here I have heard there's like an old bus that's like decrepit and parked along the side of the road. I seem to remember something like that in some other videos that I've seen. So maybe we can find this old bus and see what it's all about. So along the BDR on a forgotten mountain, on a forgotten turn, overgrown with brush and trees and whatever else, there's this old bus. We don't know the story, we'll go find the story if we can. Somebody was on a journey, there's definitely a place in here for sleeping, and uh, the old bus made it to this corner but didn't make it any farther, so obviously it's been a little used since it broke down, but um, it's not our last corner, we're gonna keep going. So we're about to come up to what I believe is called the French Creek Grade, which is some, look like, it look like to be some pretty wicked switchbacks. Oh yeah, I'm starting to see them on my map. Oh my god, that's gorgeous. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, it sure is. I'm wondering if it's worth going into low for this, because I'm assuming it's pretty steep.
we are traveling down these, uh, I think it's called the French grade switchbacks. And whoo boy, can they make you pucker just a little bit. It is a series of these really tight switchbacks etched into the side of the mountain. Um, and you know, it's the road is just fine, but psychologically, when you look over the edge, it is, it gets enough to give you vertigo, enough to make you drive very carefully. After the 2,000 plus foot drop of the French Creek grade, we made it down to the main fork of the Salmon River. So we just came down the French Creek grade and it kind of empties out, just like French Creek, it empties out into the Salmon River. And this is the main Salmon River and it is glorious. How lucky are we that we get to just be out here in the middle of nowhere on the, one of the most beautiful rivers in the world. I, I don't know, I'm just feeling really grateful. This is so cool. Oh my God, it's river. We were now too close to civilization for comfort as the Salmon River is a very popular spot for Idahoans, but we used our spidey senses to sneak our way into a spot that wound up blowing our socks off. Well, this might be a campsite down here. We couldn't believe our luck. There was just enough room for the three of our rigs, so we set up camp as quickly as we could. Kind of like licking your food in the cafeteria so no one eats it. Then we went down to see exactly what we wound up with for the night. Normally we like to find like the most remote campsites on the most remote mountaintops that no one's been to in years and years and years. But when you're driving along the Salmon River, that doesn't exist um, because it's so well used. Idaho has more white water per mile than any other state in the, in the US. And Idahoans love to go down the river. So there's a lot of people out here. And yes, there are people over there. And yes, there are people over there, but there's nobody right here. So we have privacy, we have shade, we have still water to go swimming or just sit in. I don't know, I think this is just one of those lucky accidents. So we're gonna enjoy it. Let's do this right. Let's go to Hey fish ladies, let's have some kovaki. Perhaps a fish sandwich? <laughs> Perhaps a fish sandwich. <laughs> After soaking in our good fortune by the river, Chris and I decided to give our new Otzi Flame Grill a try. This would be our inaugural use of this little flat pack grill, and Chris had just the thing to cook on it. Ribs. This little grill did an excellent job, and we ate like kings on the beach of the Salmon River that night. All right, gents. Sitting there, just the three of us, we felt ready. Ready for the next big push, ready to see more of Idaho, and specifically, ready to find our way to the iconic Magruder Corridor, which was our goal for the next day. But that meant venturing into the wildest parts of Idaho, and what we didn't know now was that everything we'd done so far was just practice for what was coming next. The Salmon River, also known as a river of no return, rushes 124 miles down the spine of Idaho and gives the sense that despite all that's going on in the world, the earth is still thriving. Last night was just amazing on this river. The temperature was perfect. Slept with the, all the windows open in the tent. Had the sound of the river all night. And this morning is just as good. Today we're gonna to change terrains in a major way. We're gonna go from this beautiful, serene river setting to uh, the Magruder Corridor. The Magruder Corridor is, is a big feature of the BDR for me anyway. Essentially, it runs between two wilderness areas and is probably the most remote road in the U.S. So we're going to swing up to Elk City, probably get some gas there, maybe resupply a little bit, and then head out to Magruder and cross the state of Idaho until we get to Darby, Montana. So we're packing up camp and we're headed to Elk City and then to the Magruder Corridor. It's gonna be kind of tough. It was really hard to, 
to pack up today, not because we were tired or anything like that, but because it's such a great spot. Now, Magruder Corridor, we think is open. We've called ahead, I've been looking at the notices. Um, it was closed uh, a while for snow. There was too much snow and, and rigs couldn't get through. Then some motorcycles got through, it looked like. Maybe some side-by-sides got through. So we're thinking with the warmer weather, we'll probably be okay. But honestly, we don't know what to expect. Should be interesting. I'm ready when you guys are. I'm ready! Also, I can't think about the Magruder Corridor without also thinking about Saturday Night Live. Magruder! You're welcome for that. Got your spotlights on. For the dust, sorry. Oh, I just God. forgot they were on. She wanted to let me know my lights were on. It was probably blinding her with my, with my bumper lights. With only a few blinded incoming rigs, we made our way across the Salmon River as we headed towards the road that would take us to the mountains. That is a beautiful bridge. This is actual pavement? This is pavement. I don't know how long we'll stay on the pavement, though. It looks like we're going to cut up into these mountains here in just a second. And it's driving me nuts. Yar. You know about the driving me nuts joke, right, Rob? No, I don't. A pirate goes into a doctor's office and he's got a ship's steering wheel sticking out of his pants. And the doctor says to him, well, what's the problem? The pirate says, yar, I got a big pain in me groin. And the doctor says, well, you got a ship's steering wheel sticking out of your pants. And the, the pirate says, yar, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I like that. So whenever somebody says, it's driving me nuts, I <laughs> say yar. <laughs> Every once in a while, man. <laughs> Okay, Grangeville, 67. Oh man, that's a great view of the river down there. As we climbed farther away from the river, we were also getting farther away from, well, just about everywhere. As the scenery started to give way to thicker woods, we soon learned that this stretch of trail was not like the rest. So we're winding our way through this beautiful mountain pass on our way to Elk City. And I heard there's a ghost town out here somewhere. So I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled for it. It's called Florence. I don't know if there's any structures. I think maybe there's a cemetery. So anyway, we're gonna keep our eyes peeled and if we see something, we're gonna stop. Um, Do you have enough room to pass? Um, I'm not gonna fit through there. Just stopping real quick to cut a branch and make room for Sir Robert to get by. I wonder if the uh, BDR folks did that for their motorcycles. But maybe to keep tundras out. Pretty sure this is an anti-tundra measure, Rob. Well, I think a tundra fit through. Oh. Oh, there, yeah. Those are widow makers right there. Yeah, so up there you could hear a tree creaking and cracking. And there's a dead one that is kind of leaning up against the live one. And they're swaying in the wind. So probably the sooner we get out of here, the better. How about we get the heck out of here? Yeah, should we knock this down and cut it? Nick my fingers again. Do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> well, can't, it's wedged between that tree and that tree. Yeah. Look at this. What a show off. Yeah, I would not javelin it. <laughs> Okay, let's go. I see done, Rob. That was a tight squeeze. I think that's some more tight trail. I feel like this is a smuggler's route. As we got deeper into the woods, we felt a sense of danger for the first time. Like this forest didn't want us there for some reason. Man, there is a crap ton of trees there that fell down. I have never seen so many downed trees. It's just a weird place. It's like something's wrong here that all the trees are down. How do you say that? Uh, I think I'm gonna need the chainsaw again. I feel like we're on the way to grandma's house in the deep dark woods right now. Does that mean there's a big bad wolf out there? Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like. It's a beautiful forest, but it is kind of eerie. As we got closer to where the ghost town of Florence might be, it felt like some of the ghosts hadn't wandered too far from the town. It feels spooky. I'm not kidding. It feels like there's something in these woods. The trees are creaking in the wind. There is a million downed trees everywhere. There's little weird kind of high-pitched whistling and, I don't know, not, not really a shriek, but just kind of high-pitched noises coming from the woods. 
you really can't see anything. It's a mix of like dead trees and alive trees. So it's almost like there's something out there watching you. It's cool, but it's uh, I'm a I'm a little uh, I'm a little wary. The hairs on my neck are standing up just a little bit. There's a guy down here, and the first thing he asked me is, "Are you guys all gold prospecting?" Well, let's just be real nice to him. Yeah, I had a little, good little chat with him. He said his brother's got a claim out here, uh, but hasn't had any luck finding any gold yet. Uh, I think I just saw a sign that said like Main Street, Old Florence. Rob looks like he's stuck in the mud. I've got a sinking feeling about this. Hot, I'm just switching to low. Nicely done. It might be worse now that you've gone through it and tore it up. He's just making excuses in case the Jeep gets stuck in the Toyota didn't. I'm doing no such thing. I see now why it's called Quicksand Road, though. No problem, rear lock for low. I may just use my locker. And my rear locker failed. So angry right now. Guys didn't do a single thing right on my rig. Not a single thing. Blinking air like a sieve is so frustrating. Just hope we don't hit anything later that needs my rear locker to work. Remind me to buy a Rubicon next time. Buy a Rubicon next time. I hope there is a ghost town on the end of this rainbow. Looks like we are in Florence. So we made it to Florence ghost town. It was a bit of a trek to get here through like the deep dark woods. And the cool thing is there are some structures here. So we're just gonna have a quick bite to eat and I'm gonna go check some of these places out. Turns out there was still some of Florence left to see. This rough and tumble gold rush boom town was settled in 1861 as the first county seat in Idaho and has enough stories to fill its own video episode. Let me out. The town quickly faded after miners sucked the earth of any precious metals, and by 1951, it was abandoned and started a slow decay. The structures that are left, though, give you an idea of what life in Florence might have been like back in the 1860s. We have been down these forgotten roads, these kind of ghost forests to get here, and it really feels like we're nowhere. But Florence used to be somewhere. Florence used to be a place that brought people together. It was a county seat, had the state's first school, the first library, the first Masonic temple. All those things happened here, out in the middle of nowhere. So it's, it's really hard to imagine how much things have changed from then to now, because there are no structures left other than what we saw. And now it's just a bunch of old trees. It really puts things into perspective to come out here and, and see these old structures and realize this was actually a really important piece of Idaho history. Just a short drive from town, we found the old cemetery with tombstones that told even more stories of Florence. So we're here in the Florence Cemetery. This was a total surprise to us. There's all these wooden headstones everywhere. Some of them are marked unknown. Some of them are marked with the person who passed away at the time, back in the late 1800s mostly. There's stories about how people died. There's uh, exhumed graves of Chinese workers. And it really, really paints a picture. I've never been to a cemetery like this. And one of the most haunting things is that all the headstones are the same. The same wooden cutout with different names on it. And it gives you this feeling that we're all the same in the end. We came to Florence, we saw Florence, and now we're headed towards Elk City again. So hopefully we can find some good trails where we can make up some time and get into uh, Magruder tonight. It would be really awesome to be able to get there tonight. If we can't, we can't, but we're gonna try. I think this is the kind of road that my suspension is made for. <laughs> I mentioned I'm having a lot of fun on this road, yeah. Yeah, I believe we're on road 221. And I, it looks like we stay on this road for quite a while. Behold the splendor of Elk City. Oh, is this it? Okay, we just hit Elk City and we got some gas, so we're good to go for another 200 miles or so. And we're airing down right now because we're about to hit the Magruder Corridor. And it's one of the most, if not the most, remote roads in the entire U.S in the entire lower 48. It splits two protected wilderness areas and there's only one road for about 
five million acres or something like that. It's incredible. So I have no idea what we're going to find when we get in there. Uh, I hope we find a campsite because we're all really, really tired. But we're going to give it a go and we're going to start Magruder. We'll see how far we get and uh, see what we find. Magruder, here we come. Magruder immediately defied our expectations. We found ourselves traveling through an immense scorched area, with fields of bear grass thriving at the feet of the ghost trees. It was almost as if the bear grass had come to pay their respects to the lost forest. Townsend made a race through the dapper shadows. Light was pouring down upon the stepping stones. Felt like morning coming for his throne. I don't know why, but it looked like a tiger's dry sky. Half the world is pulling on its colors As night in the day to the hours Glow is coming down, coming down I don't know why, but it felt like a tiger-striped sky Rob is cooking dinner tonight And ooh la la Look at this beautiful pasta meal for one he's made Made from scratch, homemade Alfredo sauce Homemade uh, chicken garlic ravioli. It was somebody made it. At, somebody it was made. made someone made it. Home. Made by humans. Yes. Maybe. Pro probably not. <laughs> probably that. not. <laughs> well, I'm grateful for any food cooked by someone else on the trail. Thank you, Rob. Absolutely. Oh, the sun setting over the wild lands of Idaho, and the skeletons of trees to keep us company. It was quiet as a graveyard at camp, and we slept like the dead. I forgot to drink my whiskey last night. Wow, that does not make a good breakfast. are right here, thereabouts. So it's a beautiful morning here on the Magruder Corridor. It was cold last night. So the night before we were on the Salmon River and it was like 100 degrees and maybe 75 degrees at night. And last night it had to be down into the 30s. It was really cold. So we were all kind of zipped up and uh, had layers on to stay warm at night. But today, we're gonna keep trekking through this road, which is one of the most remote, if not the most remote road in the entire US, lower 48. We can get 80 miles in here and 20 miles in here, I think we'll be happy. And then tomorrow we can finish Sololo and start making our way towards Wallace. I'm super excited to get going. Everybody's in good spirits. We were all a little tired last night, so we went to bed early. Everyone got a good rest last night and we we're like itching to hit the road again. So I can't wait to get going. Being in the middle of the Magruder Corridor in the daytime feels big. You can feel the history of this old Nez Perce Native American trail at every turn. And the road, which is mostly unimproved, gets so little traffic, it stays in pretty good shape. We're about to take a turn off to the Green Mountain uh, Fire Lookout, which um, I don't know if it's still manned or not. So it'll be really interesting to get up there and see um, if there's anybody else up there. If not, it still looks like a pretty great view. So we're gonna go check it out. It does not look manned. So we're here at the Green Mountain Fire Lookout and it's beautiful. For the first time since we got to the Magruder, we get uh, a pretty expansive view of the Bitterroot Mountains to the north, the Clearwater Mountains that we're headed towards to cross later today. And it's clear why they picked this as a fire lookout spot because you do truly have an incredible perspective. This fire lookout is closed. There's a sign on the gate that says, danger, do not enter. 
the gate is not locked, but it, that doesn't mean that you should go up there. So we're not gonna climb up, even though it looks very inviting. The wood looks new, the paint looks new. It almost looks like it's a manned fire station, but there's clearly nobody here and all the windows are shuttered. So now it's time to head back down a little bit and um, make it over to the clear water mountains. And next time we do the Magruder, we know where to camp. Yeah, I think so. I think that would be a great campsite. From the lookout, we pushed east through more amazing countryside. It was a beautiful day, and we had the road all to ourselves. Well, almost. Is that a Jeep coming up? We have a Jeep coming up. Woohoo! Just stopped and chatted with another Jeep that was coming over um, this direction. Hey, you guys coming over from Darby? No, we uh, just went up and stayed up to Burton Off. So they didn't have any news on the pass. But they did say that we should go to this place called Burnt Knob Lookout. And that is a rough <laughs> SOB. <laughs> I was looking on that on the map and I thought, oh, maybe I'll camp up there. You got to get up there, get okay. up to Burnt Knob. Okay. That's the best. Seriously. It's on the list. Yeah, have a great trip. Stay safe. All right. You be safe. All right, I will. Thanks. We're going to go take a look at it. Um, and uh, they said it was definitely worth checking out. So we're giving it a go. But if it's one of those things that's going to take all day, I think we might get back to the trail because we got to get into Montana today. It actually doesn't look like it's too far off the trail. It's about 1.6 miles off the trail. Yeah, but it's that little, uh, no point in not doing it. Yep, unless it's one of those 1.6 miles that takes all day. Okay, going for it. I'm gonna kick it into four low real quick. Uh, when they said four wheel drive vehicles, they meant it. <laughs> I think I very lightly scuffed a slider for the first time on this trail. All right, I just want to stop a sec and check in. Is this a fool's errand? I don't know, we're not moving very fast. I didn't any way to turn around anyway, but uh, yeah, I think this is gonna be slow going. Man, you have to earn like every inch of this trail. Think we're getting pretty close, Will? No, I do not. It looks like we're like 60% of the way there. Yeah, if it's just like a spot like this, only higher, then I'm for turning around. If we're like two thirds of the way there, we might as well keep going. Chris, you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Looks like it's got lakes off down below it, so it could be quite spectacular. I love watching you guys go between like two large rocks, and then when I get there, I just have to drive over them. I think it's pretty spectacular up there. You guys see up and to our left, there's like that, there's like a cabin. Uh, that's probably the fire lookout. Yeah, but they don't even have to put it like on any uh, post or anything. It's just out there. That was a lot of effort, but I think that was worth giving up. We're at the edge of this, I don't know, eight, 800 foot cliff, three lakes below, and it's just one of the most incredible sights I've ever seen. Out in the distance, you can see Clearwater Mountains. But what's great about the view up here is you can see layers and layers and layers and layers of land. And it feels like we made a wrong turn when we started. Man, is this worth it. I'm gonna fall. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're trying to experience this and film it without dying. And there are moments where I feel like that could really happen, the dying part, especially when you're wearing flip-flops. So note to self, next time you come to a mountain ledge, wear close toed shoes. Maybe we should make some like overland flip-flops. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but that was what every second of the drive. I agree, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Chris, I'm, my odometer is showing 784 miles so far. Oh, that's very cool. With two fire towers and one rough road under our belt, we were starting to get a feel for this trail, like we belonged here. The road's much nicer up here. That is, besides the odd trees sticking out the side. We've 
been through a lot of burned forest, and this forest was also burned. But there's a ton of new growth. So it's like it's a new forest, just a baby forest. It's nice to see that. Even after all we'd seen today, Magruder still had one more thing to show us. Maybe the most important thing of all. This is probably a significant spot, I'm assuming. Yes, it is. Is this the murder spot? Yes, it is. So this is the spot that marks the Magruder Massacre, which is how this trail, this road, this the most remote road that we know of, got its name. Magruder was a merchant who wanted to go to Montana to take advantage of the mining commerce that was happening there. So he took his whole posse, he took all these goods, he made a bunch of money in Montana, but he waited too long to come back. He didn't come back until October. And by that time, all of his posse had kind of already gone back because of the snows, and he had to hire new people. Well, these new people that he hired were unscrupulous. And about five and a half miles away from this point is where in the middle of the night, they brutally murdered them with axes and shotguns, took their bodies and dumped them in a ravine, stole all their money and fled. However, this is not a story about murder. I think this is a story about friendship because Magruder's friend thought something was off. These guys came back, they had lots of money, they seemed a little off and he said, where's Magruder? They said, who's Magruder? He said, no, 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 I don't believe you. And so they fled, they went to California. He went to the deputies and he said, I think something happened to Magruder, he's my friend, I wanna do something about it right now. And they said, we'll deputize you. So he chased them down all the way to San Francisco, found one of their party that confessed to the murders, brought them all back to Idaho and they hanged him for the murder of Magruder. Even after justice was served, he knew that the bodies were out here in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the wilderness. And he took a party and he went out and he searched and searched and searched until they found the bodies and gave them proper burials. That's why we call this road Magruder and we talk about the massacre, but really, I like the story because it's really, uh, it's about justice, it's about friendship, and it's about doing what's right. With our minds sufficiently blown by everything we did today, all that was left was to get to Darby and then to the Lolo Motorway. So we started laying down the dust. Wow, this is like such a different trail than we've had. That's totally different. So we are driving through this super windy, almost like jungly, overgrown part of the Magruder, and I'm trying to catch up to the guys. It's almost like a Mario Kart race or something like that, but it's a ton of fun. It's really nice to just have these Jeeps that do so well off-road, throw them in four-wheel high and let it rip. Well, we just hit pavement it's around five o'clock and we're still hoping to head into the Lolo Pass after hitting Darby. So, but I think we're gonna be making camp kinda late tonight. This is your friendly reminder to take your rig out of four wheel drive if you have not already. Uh, appears we're going on the paved road, so I'm gonna pull up up here and air up. Well, Chris, we did it. We did the Magruder, something that's been on our bucket list for a long time. Yeah, it feels pretty great. So, but the adventure continues. So got. Lolo. Yep. And God knows what else is north of Lolo. Yeah. Wallace. Wallace. I can't wait for Wallace. Yeah, oh my Wallace. God. So many good stories there. Yeah. And in beautiful Canada. It's only day seven, folks. <laughs> but it feels much longer. But it feels like it's day 15. <laughs> <laughs> so we just pulled in uh, to this little campsite to air up our tires before we hit Darby. And we pulled in and we noticed, actually Chris noticed, that there is a uh, fire that's still smoldering. You can see the smoke coming out of it. So whoever's here last left this fire essentially still going it's something that we all need to be mindful of make sure that your fire is dead out there is no smolder there's no smoke it's totally totally dead otherwise this could start another wildfire like we saw across the magruder corridor uh, we're in montana now feels different here more buffalo-y like we're coming into derby here pretty quick okay i see it 26 and a half Rob wins. So we were having contests see he needed the most gas. Rob wins, but he didn't fill up last time with us. So actually he probably wins both ways. So up there you can see there's a new forest fire. It was just to the south of us. We didn't see it until we got to Darby. See that fire, Chris? It just started. Just started. We just came through there, man. But it's about 12,000 acre forest fire. 
So let's hope we can squeeze through within, without any of these things affecting our travel. We're gonna go get dinner in Darby and then we're gonna be night driving into the Lola motorway. Rob's got some spots he knows about 20 miles in, so we're gonna trust him to lead the way and uh, do some night wheeling on the Lolo. Let's go. When you've been focused on driving for 10 straight hours, you're tired. We were tired, but drove on. After dinner, we hit Highway 93 North up to Lolo, Montana, then started back west on Highway 12 with a quick stop before hitting dirt again. So we're here at the Locksaw Lodge, which is the last gas stop before the Lolo motorway. It's 9.30 at night right now. It's definitely getting dark. The sun has set. We probably have 20 minutes of light left before it gets dark, dark out here. I'm a little nervous. Um, but I'm really excited. I'm a little tired because it's late and I just don't know what to expect. So let's go find out. And now we're turning onto Lolo. The Lolo motorway. Now, it got dark fast, really dark. Rob was eating the way because he'd driven this stretch before, and even though we were tired, we stayed together and found some spots to squeeze in a little more fun on the trail. So uh, it's uh, about 11 o'clock at night. Um, we just got into camp. We found, we, the, the first campsite that we thought we were going to, we decided was a little bit too small for everybody. So um, Rob found this um, alternate, which is great. We're all kind of packed in here, but we're close together, which is good. There's enough room for everybody. It feels like there might be bears right outside the woods looking at us. So we're a little nervous about that. Um, but we're just setting up camp and we're gonna go read a sign together but we have kind of a rule like always have a headlamp have your bear spray on you just in case yeah double fisting bear spray all the yeah. time <laughs> <laughs> pew 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 rob's seen some some deer and some things i haven't seen anything yet but um i will say that that probably nothing's gonna happen my, my logical brain knows that but my emotional brain is also just a little bit scared because we're in the deep 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 dark woods all right we decided to walk and go read a sign in the night which is the only thing we have left to do tonight did you have a bourbon oh uh, besides bourbon definitely we earned a bourbon today all right snowbank snowbank camp it's like camp tear Lewis and Clark, Lewis and Clark camp tear yeah it seems like an awfully small camp maybe it's bigger than it was or maybe it was bigger than it is now get my water and my Garmin, and my bear spray. These are the core essentials. Time for bed. The Lolo Trail is an ancient Nez Perce travel route used to cross the Bitterroot Mountains into Montana in order to trade and hunt buffalo. In 1805, Lewis and Clark, aided by Sacagawea, used this trail to traverse the most difficult section of their trek west. The trip took them nine days. We needed to finish it this morning in order to rendezvous with my buddy Jake, who was planning to join us for the last leg of the trip. However, what we didn't know this morning was how many trees, fires, and mechanical issues were waiting for us on the trail. Good morning. What a night. Last night we spent uh, a lot of the night driving. Today, we may or may not be meeting with our buddy Jake in Wallace. And when I say may or may not, it's because I'm not sure we can make it to Wallace today. Like, I've already texted him on my Garmin uh, InReach Mini to let him know that uh, he may be staying in Wallace alone tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah, well, Wallace is famous for its uh, brothels. Yeah. So he won't be alone. Sorry. No, 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 Jake. Jake, Jake, Jake. 
we know you won't be visiting those brothels. Yeah, they've been closed for like decades. So So sorry, Jake, they're closed. So you can't. I'm really excited to see this Lolo Trail because the Lolo Trail is uh, is such a, an important piece of Western history. Mm-hmm. And this trail was the way in which Lewis and Clark got west through the Bitterroot Mountains, which we're going to pass today. And they needed the aid of the Native Americans that were here. Otherwise, they would not have made it. And I can imagine that Lewis and Clark party trudging along. Yeah, I think trudging is the right word, too. Yeah, they were at the end of their journey, and they were tired, and it was, you know, it was cold. It was September when they were here. Yeah, and there's, like, just a sign right here next to our camp about, like, an incident where some horses slid, and a couple of them died, and so... They ate the horses! They ate the horse, yeah. I mean, you know, that's where they were at. We have much better food, uh, (laughs) and we are much better supplied... And so, but we get to pretend for a second that we're Lewis and Clark. Yeah. I don't know which one you want to be. You want to be Lewis or Clark? I want to be Clark. Okay, I'll he was be less crazy. <laughs> I'm a little more crazy. That makes sense. All right, let's hit the trail. And by the way, uh, we're having horse steaks for dinner tonight. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that didn't sound good. Did you hear that? It sounded like a Jeep. <laughs> sounded like you have a tin can rattling around in your engine. That is the engine. <laughs> You're such a jerk. You ready, kid? Ready, Dad. Got it, Bob. All right, let's roll. Rolling. So we're 14.7 miles into the Lolo, guys. Only 100 more to go. I think 110. My guy at trip, whatever tracker says, our average speed has just been like 6.7 miles an hour. Still faster than Lewis and Clark, though. This morning, we immediately felt like the trail was rougher and less maintained than Magruder. And before long, we hit the first of many stops. I feel like this section wasn't quite cleared for a full-size truck. Yeah, I think this tree's gonna need trimming. Give you a hand. We all brought the same DeWalt chainsaw with extra batteries just for such an occasion. While Magruder was massive with a lot of burned areas, the Lolo looked pristine, even if the trail was rougher. The forests were thicker, which made it hard to see our surroundings, but every now and then we'd hit a ridge that gave us a million dollar view of the bitter roots and beyond. We're just driving along and we found this adventure bike windshield. Somebody lost this, dang it. So. We'll pick it up and see if we come by anybody missing a windshield. Just an okay view. Cool little view off to the left. I'm still amazed at how much Idaho changes. After eight days on the trail, I kept expecting things to start looking the same. But each vista we'd come across blew my mind. Especially if you stop to think about how the trail originally came to pass and how we use it today. So many different people, different generations, different technologies have passed along this dirt trail. And it's so tied to how we settled the West, for better or worse. It's really hard not to get swept up in the history of it all. Rob and I are at the Indian Post Office. Okay, I'm just about there. Hey, Willie. So we're up on this ridge, and it has this expansive view of the mountains, the Bitterroot Mountains that we're crossing right now. And I can only imagine what Lewis and Clark were feeling and their and their party were feeling when they looked at those mountains and they thought, we have to get over those things? That's impossible. We're tired, it's cold, there's no way we're gonna make it. And uh, it's this trail that they used to get across these mountains and stay alive and make it west. And the rest is history, but these these views to us are awe-inspiring and majestic, but I'm, you know, if I put myself in their shoes, it's pretty daunting and intimidating. The Indian Post Office, or maybe better called the Smoking Place by the Nez Perce or Nemi Pune Native Americans, is a sacred site. The notion of post office comes from the belief that Native Americans could send messages or commune with healing spirits from this place. They would stop for a ceremonial smoke and receive inspiration and healing from the Creator. It definitely feels like a sacred spot. There's an old feeling to the trees and rocks, and I can understand why a person feels closer to the Creator here. My um, trip computer said that we have gone 
1,010 miles, which also looks like Lolo. One of my biggest fears of overlanding is that one day seeing these views will seem redundant, like just one more mountain and one more forest I've seen a million times. While the Lolo didn't quench my thirst for incredible scenery, it did make it so I never want to see a downed tree again. Road, while not difficult, is way more technical than I imagined. Yeah, it's a lot worse shape than it was when I came through here last year. Tight squeeze, isn't it? Yeah, it is. My back tire fell in. Not a low hanging tree. There was a That was an 11 squeezing through there. Did you have to move anything? No, but it's been really tight. I've had to drive over several things. Can you imagine being first through this trail this year? You'd uh, have to bring either a ton of batteries or a ton of gas. I think we're talking hundreds of trees. Yeah, I think that's uh, probably a safe estimate. And that tree looked like some sort of like Tim Burton monster trying to grab us. Need to cut, Rob? Yeah, I think we're gonna have to cut again. Rob's got wood again. So yeah, it's turning into a Chains little bit of a now. theme. Yeah, uh, having to do a little trimming. I do wonder, like, you know, why they cut them so narrow. Hopefully they weren't driving a Tundra or a Jeep. Yeah, they may have just been like on a side-by-side -side or something. We're about halfway through the Lolo, and it's really slow going because there are a ton of downed trees. And while most of them aren't a problem for uh, Chris and I in our Jeeps, Rob is just about six inches wider than we are and there's a couple spots that have been pretty tight. And so I'm hopeful that we'll get through this section and get some open road that doesn't have quite so many obstacles in it. Dust floating around in the forest almost makes it look like it has a, like a magical mist except that it's dry, dusty dust. I feel like I have sandpaper in my eyes right now. It looks like we're, what, three quarters, two, two thirds, three quarters down here. As excited as we were to drive the Lolo, we were ready for it to be over and ready for something easy. Unfortunately, that's not what we got. After the Lolo, we hit a few more blind corners that made us regroup a bit. Well, it's, the evening, it's like 7.30, or maybe it's 6.30, it's 7.30 mountain time. And uh, we made it through Lolo. It took, I'll do the math later, many, many hours. And uh, we really want to get to camp. We had a great camp recommendation that we were going for, but the roads are closed. It happens out here because they're logging or construction or whatever. So we have to figure out an alternate route to get to where we were going because the BDR is actually closed down. So they have a detour here that we're gonna follow. And we're gonna try to make it to a campground that's near the Dror Shack Reservoir Bridge. Uh, and I just hope that it's a good road, hope we can still get there. I hope it doesn't take us too long because we're all so tired, so dirty. I think we just wanna like take showers and have dinner and I just don't know when that's gonna happen. The detour was significant, but the roads were okay, so we made decent time. However, a few miles from our campsite, we came across something that stopped us in our tracks. We're making our way down to the Granddad Bridge, and it looks like there's a fire that just started. Well, this is Idaho, and we know that there is snow season and fire season. And we, we knew we'd be threading the needle on this trip. We knew it. And now we're heading down into Dwarf Shark Reservoir, to, to camp for the night, and there is um, a forest fire that just started. It's, it looks to be on the other side of the reservoir, but we have some decisions to make now. You know, this is, this is, this is part of living in Idaho's forest fires. Every year there's forest fires, and um, running the BDR is risky because you've got to time it just right or figure out what your detours are gonna be. So we thought we timed it right. I think we're still really, really close. But um, we may have to go back to the map and see if there's a safer route. I was just measuring the distance from us to the fire, and it's 5.7 miles. As we got closer, we could tell the fire was on the other side of the reservoir. So we decided to take a reasonable risk and make our way to Granddad Bridge Campground, which sits on the edge of the water. So we made it to Granddad Campground, and it's um, it's not what we would normally do. We normally wouldn't stay in a campground. So it really isn't even a campground. It's more of a boat launch. Um, but. We're on the we're on the Dorshack Reservoir, which is absolutely gorgeous, and so we're looking forward to just sitting down and looking at the water uh, before going to bed. We don't typically like to camp around people, but there's nice folks here. 
So we're just gonna call it a day, start making dinner and start washing up. To say we were tired is an understatement. The BDR had beat us down, but Chris decided to break out the Otzi grill, get a fire going, and make something that would take our minds off our fatigue. Turns out ribs cooked on an open flame have healing powers, and we went to bed that night feeling grateful for our little boat launch camping spot. We learned the difference between miserable and perfect is just a state of mind. We all slept in just a bit the next morning and woke up to the sounds of helicopters putting out the forest fire from the night before. Today would bring about more change, some we'd predicted and others that would surprise us and not in a good way. Our goal was to make it to Avery where we'd meet up with our buddy Jake from Seattle who would join us for the last leg of the route. So we took a few moments to savor the morning before getting our minds invested in what we'd be tackling later in the day. Good morning from the beautiful Dorshack Reservoir. Um, we were gonna get out the drones and kind of show you uh, Rorschach Reservoir, which is phenomenally beautiful. But because there's a forest fire about six miles away, we're gonna be really, really careful about flying the drones because we, we don't want to interfere with any operations that are going on. I woke up this morning to the sound of helicopters, so we're gonna leave the drones in the ground for now. So today, we all would love to have an easy day. We've had two amazing but grueling days. Roughly it's 100 miles from here to Wallace. Um, there's one pass that was snowed in like last week. We don't know what we're gonna get into. We don't think we're gonna get into snow, but we may have wet conditions. We may have trees down because, uh, because of the snow and maybe there hasn't been too much traffic through there. Um, and so I cannot wait to get into those trees and find those stories and share them with you. So yesterday we ran into about 350 down trees and neither of us changed into shoes. We kept our flip flops on the whole time. Yeah, so what's gonna happen is we're putting our shoes on and we will not run into a single down tree today. It's a good luck charm. It is, it's, it's also Murphy's Law. Once we got going, we started ripping through the countryside. The roads were flat and fast, and we knew there was questionable terrain ahead, so we used every opportunity to make miles where we could. Rob's Tundra was made for this type of terrain, and with him in the lead, our Jeeps were having a hard time keeping up. How far ahead is Rob it? You're not going to catch me. Let me just say this. That Tundra rips. Will, you're on your own. Will, are you still with us? Hey guys, there you are. Pretty. The speed of our travel almost kept us from seeing the thickly forested mountains we were slicing through on our way to Avery. This was shaping up to be another incredible Idaho morning. I don't know what buzz they are, but they're cool. I think they might be buzzards because of the way they're soaring. I think it's pronounced bizarre. turn off these nice maintained flat roads and get into some I think a little bit more rough roads as we make uh, this climb over the mountain so I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like I have had enough down trees for a trip but we'll we'll take what we can get and um, hopefully get into Avery to meet Jake my buddy who's joining us for the last leg of the trip for lunch so we got a lunch date Serious stuff. Yeah, been trampled by logging trucks, I bet. Oh, uh, what time should I tell them to meet us there, do you think? Like 1230 then? Be aware that that's a, a, a very rough guess. Depends a lot on how well the tre trees have been cleared on this road. Uh, I'm definitely saying Rob said it'll be exactly two hours. And if we're not there in two hours, it's definitely not that. that seems right. As we got higher and deeper into the mountains, we were also getting closer to retracing Rob's footprints from his previous two attempts at the Idaho BDR. His last attempt at this pass was thwarted by heavy snow, winching, and some very uncomfortable circumstances. This is the area where we finally gave up because of the snow. It was 
I gave us banked up all the way up to the trees on the right hand side of the trail. Well, knock on wood, it's very different today. It is very different. There are a couple of patches of snow, but nothing on the trail yet. I don't know if you can imagine just how creepy it was here. Foggy, the other all the trees are dripping. I remember watching that on your video, Rob, and thinking that just looks miserable. I didn't get that it was spooky, though. Yeah, you guys must have been just exhausted. So this is the spot where I finally had enough of uh, winching and turned around. I think this is the exact spot that we just camped in the middle of the trail. Like we just had sideways, so we were flat and set up camp. It's really pleasant in here right now. I'm pretty sure this tree on the right is one that I cleared three years ago. As much fun as we were having reliving Rob's adventures, there was something else that started to get my attention, and it was coming from my Jeep. Well, clicking, it almost sounds like something's dangling. So we're on this bumpy trail, crossing over the pass, haven't had much snow, which is great. Actually, the trail's in great shape, just a little rocky. I've noticed the sound. It's a weird, there's a weird squeaking, clicking, it's coming from under the rig. Um, not really sure, I guess it could be the drive shaft. I put a Rezepa joint in, that's a, like a, it's a, it's a joint that uh, is for lifted Jeeps because sometimes the drive shaft can fail if the angle is too severe. So I put that in a few months ago so this wouldn't happen, but I don't even know if that's it. So I'm gonna keep troubleshooting and try driving in four wheel drive and then two wheel drive and see if I still hear it and uh, try to figure it out. I don't think I'm in any major danger. I don't think my Jeep's gonna break down. I think it's just uh, gonna be annoying for a bit. This is a good opportunity to gloat about Toyotas. Absolutely, every opportunity to build on Toyotas until your CV boot blows. So the sound is getting worse. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's my drive shaft. It sounds like there's gravel in my drive shaft, but um, I'm hoping that this is not gonna stop me from getting up to Canada. Hey, well, I just noticed that it's already 12 o'clock, so I don't know if we're gonna make that 12.30 rendezvous with Jake. So I'm sending him the message now that we are running late. Mountain Pass is taking longer. Be there as soon as we can. Sorry for the delay. Over 1,100 miles of this trip. That's a lot of miles, man. Mostly in four-wheel drive. And they're down. Oh, got a fawn up here. See it running right in front of you? I'm gonna stop here. Hopefully I find a place to leave. Feel bad we're scaring the little guy down the road. Must be really lost. He's trying to get past and that's why every time I try to do that, it dash across in front of me. Yeah, I saw that. That looks like a very new deer. Now, at least now it's leaving the road. We were now two hours late for our rendezvous with Jake, so I pushed my Jeep as hard as I dared on the windy roads leading into town. I was feeling pessimistic for the first time on this trip, and doubt had crept into my mind. But before I can dwell on it too much, we approached the town of Avery, Idaho. You ready to hold your breath? So much dust in here. Avery, Idaho is one of the few towns in this area that wasn't scorched by the Great Fire of 1910. Thanks to the quick action of the 25th Regiment, or the Buffalo Soldiers, the town was saved. Yeah, I think we're here. You guys, I'm gonna go look for a gladiator with a smart cap on it. Mention around Frontier State, you guys out there? Uh, yeah, Jake, we are. We're at the, uh, we're at the train in, uh, Avery. Where are you at? I'm near the gas station, little market here in Avery. Okay, I'm coming there. I'll see you in just a second. got the right idea. So we made it to Avery. I gotta tell you, this place is a, it's a blessed little spot. The St. Joe River is running through it. This whole area was burned. Three million acres was burned back in 1910. All these trees that we see now have regrown since then. And the way some people survived was to get in the river while the, while the firestorm passed overhead, or they would get in a train and get inside a tunnel and wait for the, 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 the fire to pass. And so we're about to go see uh, some iconic stretch of road. We might be in a few tunnels ourselves and it'll be really, really fun to just kind of think about what it was like back then when this was happening, those towns that were mining towns and logging towns and then this crazy incredible uh, fire that happened that actually kind of solidified the U.S. National Forest Service into what it is today. So um, obviously I'm excited about this, I can't wait. 
Avery is a place where the trees and tunnels tell a story of an early Idaho territory, where gold and silver brought miners and the forests brought the railroads. The mines produce more silver than any other part of the country, and the railroads have now been turned into roads that wind along the river and through the mountains. This area was flooded with outlaws, but gave birth to heroes, as we learn tomorrow. Tonight, we wanted to take it easy. We found a spot right on the river. The early evening shadows gave us a cool shade to set up camp while Jake got to know the guys. And we all celebrated being done early for once. So we're at camp now and we're somewhere between Avery and Wallace. I really wanted to get to Wallace today, but we couldn't do it just because it was getting late in the day. We had some things that we needed to get done at camp today. And, and we found a spot on the river, which is probably like the most important thing. So tonight we're gonna sit around, maybe, I don't know, have a beer. We're gonna celebrate that Jake made it. We hooked up with Jake and Avery and he's with us tonight. So we'll be wheeling with him tomorrow. Jake, you made it. I made it. We missed our rendezvous yesterday by a couple hours and uh, we met up today, it was awesome. You're driving your Gladiator with the Smart Cap. I am. How's that? It's great. I love the Smart Cap. I'm actually sleeping in, in the back of the rig in the Smart Cap, so we'll see. Very cool. I'm glad we connected. I'm glad you made it. Can't wait to hang out tomorrow. Yep, I'm super glad. Because I'm not going to hang out with you tonight <laughs> at all. We're definitely not going to have beers tonight. <laughs> not at all. So Jake, not only did you join us on the trail today, but you decided to make dinner. What do we got? We've got some beef kebabs. Oh. And then we also have a, a really nice mix. It's Brussels sprouts, green lentils, butternut squash, cremini, mushrooms, tahini, turmeric, and some hazelnuts. Let's eat that now. Yes, let's eat it now. So I've decided all of this goodness that Jake cooked up should go into a tortilla before I eat it. And how great is this? The river flowing by, sitting here looking at the trees, having this delicious dinner. After nine days, dozens of challenges, and over a thousand miles on the trail together, we had become something more than just friends or travel companions. We were now partners on a journey and the next two days would bring about the biggest challenges of the entire trip and put the outcome up for grabs. But in this moment, we stayed together in the present, toasted our adventure, and laughed at Rob's glowing wizarding staff he used to find his way back to the rig at night. Good night, Rob. <laughs> Good night, Gandalf. This morning I had to face the fact that I might not be finishing the BDR. I was determined to get to Wallace and hike the Ed Pulaski Trail since it was a sojourn for me and I wasn't about to have come all this way just to turn back 30 miles before the trail. What I didn't know was whether or not my Jeep would make it. Luckily, the drive to Wallace should be easy. Well, what do you think, man? Is thing gonna make it? I don't know, but there's nothing to do but just drive to Wallace anyway. There's no services or cell coverage out here, so I don't really have an option. Well, I guess in the meantime, you know, I hope you can enjoy the drive. Yeah, I'll holler if anything happens. Until then, let's roll. These bridges and tunnels were built for the railroads, whose sparks started the 1,200 fires that combined into one super fire back in 1910. They were also a place of refuge for people fleeing the flames. Rail cars jammed with people would park on a trestle or inside a tunnel to escape the torrent of fire sweeping through three million acres of forests in less than two days. These tunnels are pretty small, but the nerve rack is just sitting there. Yeah, yeah definitely. Can you imagine being on one of those rail cars back then and walking through Burn. Can you imagine not being in a train car and running for your life? Yeah, I'll take the train car any day. Man, I bet the flames were likely going faster than, than we are right now. And yeah, they didn't have like radios or TV or internet. They just had to like look at the red glow in the sky, feel the heat, and us. I don't feel like we really have a frame of reference for something like that today. The carnage of 1910 is also a story of heroes like Ed Pulaski, a forest ranger who saved the lives of 45 men by holding them at gunpoint in an old mine and narrowly escaping death himself. A bucket list item for me was to go see that cave. That's pretty. Uh, you guys, I'm still hearing that sound on my Jeep. In fact, it's getting worse. Do you need to stop, Will? I don't think so, but I'm going to hang back and go slow. It's like vibrating Oh man, that is not good. We can uh, check it out when we get to pavement. I get the Blasky Trail even if I have to walk there. Well, I'd give you a ride. I'm pretty sure I have the room. Do you have room for all of my whiskey? Always. So, the, uh, the, the, the Rezeppa 
joint was really, really loose, so I tightened it up. I'm just gonna drive it a little bit and see if there's anything different. I have low expectations and high hopes. Here goes nothing. Can you hear it? I heard it, I heard it once, yeah. I decided to say goodbye to Rob and hike the trail before it got too late. The Jeep would have to wait until after. Bye, Rob, we'll miss you. Bye. Rob, come back. Come back, Rob. Rob's departure, while not totally unexpected, still felt a little rushed. What we didn't know at the time was that as our BDR journey continued, Rob had a journey of his own. He was driving towards something very different, something that changes your life forever. You see, Rob had a date with someone he'd never met before. But I think it's safe to say they hit it off. And I also hear the little guy has great taste in YouTube channels. So we're here at the beginning of the Ed Pulaski Trail. I am so excited to see what's up there. This story, this event in history has totally captured my imagination. I really hope we can get a good view of the cave. I, I'm just, I feel drawn to this story. I want to go experience and be closer to history. So anyway, we're going to get a head start. Let's get going. The trail was steep with dense underbrush, so dense in fact that I crashed my drone and lost it in a ravine. Then I lost my phone while searching for my drone. $2,000 and hours of footage donated to the trail. We're hiking the Ed Pulaski Trail right now, and uh, I've had a series of epic failures. I crashed my drone and lost it. I lost my phone when I was looking for my drone. So, oh man, it's been a bad day that way, but I still want to carry on and see uh, the cave where Ed Pulaski saved all those guys. So we're just gonna keep going. I'm gonna chalk it up to the experience and hopefully learn from it. And uh, not let it ruin my day. I had to find a way to recover mentally from such a huge mistake. And as I got to the end of the trail, it was way up the side of the hill from the actual cave. I really wanted to get down there and see it up close. And then I spotted a way down. There's a little trail that brings you down to the cave itself. This behind me is the cave where Ed Pulaski led 45 men in there during the fire of 1910. And you have to imagine this place was an inferno. Everything was being burnt down. There were, there were 60 mile an hour winds. The firestorm was creating its own weather pattern. It was sucking up logs from, from the ground, burning them and shooting them out in the air. I mean, this entire area had exploded like a nuclear bomb. Fire was moving faster than anyone could outrun. And he knew of this mine that was here. He had his men follow him, let him in here, and he hung wet blankets from the top of the cave opening. He had them all go in there, and there's water in that cave. He had them lay down in the water, face down, so they could just barely, barely breathe. This whole thing was being burned, and these massive cedar trees were falling and tumbling down. And it must have felt like an earthquake inside this, inside this cave. And the guys were panicking, and they wanted to get out of here and run away from the fire. And Ed Pulaski pulled out his gun, and he pointed at him, and he said, if you try to leave this cave, I will shoot you. He knew that if they left, that if they gave into that impulse to run, they would surely die, or they had a chance to live if they stayed here. Like he saved so many people. What happened here in this forest with Ed Pulaski is truly the birth of the modern National Forest Service. Public opinion turned in favor of the National Forest Service, and legislators had to fund it because there was a, there was a public mandate to support these brave souls who died fighting to save the towns of Wallace and Avery. And so because of that, we have what we now know as a National Forest Service. Anyway, this is just a really, really important moment for me in this trip, in my life, and I am super happy to share it with you. Whew, we just got back down from the Pulaski Trail and it's time to address my drag shaft. So I'm gonna crawl under here and I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take it out because it sounds like rocks in a washing machine right now. So I'm going to disconnect the, uh, the crossbars and try to get this thing out and then just drive the rest of the way in two-wheel drive.
sound that I was hearing was something like this. And it was really loud and, not, and just not doing very well. And this lip on the Rosepa joint here was designed by Terraflex to keep it in there. But if you look, it's totally destroyed. So this is not good. This whole thing did not hold up to the punishment that I gave it. So uh, I got this Rosepa joint to prevent this from happening, what just happened. And unfortunately it happened anyway, even with this Rosepa joint that was designed for high clearance vehicles. And so the good news is, it's just a drive shaft. I hope that's the only thing that's wrong. If I can keep driving, it's my front drive shaft. So I'll just do the rest uh, with two wheel drive. And it couldn't have happened at a better time because from here on out, I don't think we're gonna have many like very difficult roads. They're gonna be mountain roads, but they're not gonna be like, like when we climbed up the Burnt Knob on the Magruder Corridor or like half of the Lolo that was super, super rough where we might need four wheel drive or like really steep and uh, steep inclines and declines where you know you wanna put it in four low and coast down. So I'm hopeful that um, be smooth sailing after this. We'll see. like a kitten now that was definitely a drive shaft we're good let's go uh, let's go into let's go to Wallace and have some dinner Wallace Idaho was founded in 1884 and is a uniquely Idahoan place that has reinvented itself several times over the years including declaring a downtown manhole the center of the universe what are you a tourist oh, no, we're the worst we're from Idaho though we're Idahoans. <laughs> get out of here at the moment, we were fully aboarding the BDR and decided to just get a motel room and grab dinner at one of Wallace's local restaurants. I was so tired and frustrated, I considered quitting. But Chris reminded me, we were down, but not out. It's been a pretty great day, but it's had some really shitty stuff. But we will prevail. The next morning, I was on fire again. A good night's sleep and a clean bed at the Stardust Motel rekindled my desire to finish the BDR. We were going to go all in today, missing drive shaft and all, and finish the rest of the route. We were up bright and early and ready to hit the road. Look at this guy all cleaned up from his hotel, motel I should say, ready for a, a hard day on the trail guys. Yep. Heck yeah. We're going to make a big push today. What, what was the name of that movie? Vanishing Point. We're going to Vanishing Point the rest of this trail. Yeah, Kowalski, here we come. Okay, we're off, fellas. Canada or bust. Like bust the drive shaft. Too soon? Too soon, Chris. Too soon. Or bust the drone and lose a phone? I said too soon, Chris. We were making decent time heading up the mountains just north of Wallace, and while it was thick forest underneath, when we hit the mountain tops, these trees gave way to some spectacular North Idaho mountains. Chris, what does your odometer say? Mine says 1,224. So much for a 1,200 mile Idaho BDR. Yeah, I think all the detours and side roads add up a bit. Well, no more side roads. We're driving straight to Canada now. By straight, you mean following the winding BDR route? Yeah, exactly. Oh man, the views up here are incredible. Yeah, there's so much moisture in the air, it makes the mountains look blue. Nice, these roads are in such good shape too. Feels like we're making good time. Yeah, definitely. Everything was going so well this morning, which was such a relief after so much bad luck the day before. We were making good time, we were getting beautiful views, we missed Rob, but we were determined to get to Canada. And then the BDR decided to hand me one more lesson. This one wasn't as painful as a dry shaft, but maybe more expensive. Hey, Will, what you doing over there? Oh, I am hoping I didn't totally destroy my drone. It hit a, it took a tree on the side. It, uh, I was flying just like I normally do, and the sensors must have missed a tree or something, and it, it hit here and catapulted into the ground. I think it's going to be okay. I lost the ND filter on the front. I lost the propeller. I may have lost enough of this propeller that I can't fly it anymore. That's what I'm checking out. But, yeah, you know. It's a two drone trip. Four failures in less than 24 hours. Two drones, one phone, and a drive shaft, all kaput. As upset at myself as I was, I tried really hard not to let these failures take away from the incredible ride we were still on. 
very well. I wish Rob was here to see this. Yeah, I think he's on like a 32-hour paved road trek right now. I think he would have liked to see some of this. I know he's been through Wallace and Lolo, but I think he was hoping to get this far north. Well, we're up to rub in his face next time we see him. Seems appropriate. Will, you hearing anything or feeling anything with your drive shaft? You mean, am I having phantom drive shaft sound? Yeah, something like that. No, everything seems fine. But mentally, I'm just like waiting for something else to go wrong. I hear you. I'm sure it'll be fine, though. My Jeep is holding up just fine so far. No more noises. Uh, I'm in two-wheel drive, but these are very easy mountain roads, so I'm not thinking I'm going to need four-wheel drive much. So we are pushing the Clark Fork, but also enjoying the views at the same time, because after all, we're here sightseeing, essentially. This is our vacation. We're seeing all of Idaho from, from the back road, so we're trying to also take in those views and be mindful to each other that it's not a race, even though we want to finish today. We also want to take our time, let it soak in and enjoy it. I gotta hand it to the RightPDR.org folks who created this route. They did their homework and they keep you way out in the backcountry to the very last second. At this point in the trip, fatigue started to become a real factor. Look, I know we're not hiking or backpacking these roads, but the last thing you want to do out here is doze off at the wheel. Boy, theme for this trip is just how long it takes to do these sections. We left at 7.30 this morning after we got gas and everything. And it's 2.40, so what is that, seven, seven hours? Okay, Jim, we're coming into Clark Fork. I don't know about you, but I'm so tired right now. I think we should just grab gas, grab an energy drink, and keep going. You know, if we're going to make it to Canada, I think that's a great idea. What are you doing? We don't have time to lay down on the grass. we got to get to Canada. <laughs> Look gotta, at this. i got to stretch my body out. <laughs> making such great time on these roads. Yeah, there's a ton of traffic out here though. Well, it's beautiful. I can see why people keep coming out here. The road is super dusty, but it's really well maintained so far. Hey, I think after we come down this path, we're gonna be on pavement for the rest of the way. Really? Pavement? Yeah, I think we're almost done with the dirt. Jake, you're not airing up because you never aired down. Didn't have to. Because you don't have any rubber on those things. No, that's right. Lift, tires, wheels are on the dock. Yes. All right, that's what I want to hear. Hey, Will, that yeah. sound in the background, that may be the sound of our last air up. I know. It's, it's almost surreal. It's almost like a little emotional to air up. <laughs> like I'm getting a little emotional about it because it's a signal maybe that we're nearing the end. And it's been... It has been such an adventure. Like it has been, we've had so many amazing experiences and mishaps and stupid mistakes and unexpected surprises that were both good and bad. And, you know, I don't think I can really process it. I think it's gonna take me some time to like really sit down and remember and, and kind of catalog how this trip was because right now it's just been so fast on the road for so long. I popped up my tent and broke down my tent so many times. It's like, I was starting to kind of sink in, I guess. on dirt roads or 1400 miles on my odometer and I am speechless.
<laughs> oh man, we made it. It's been a long journey. Holy cow. Dude, 1,400 miles. Glad I joined up, even though it was only for a part of the trip. Wish I could have been here for the whole trip. Sounds like it's been pretty epic. Well, we're here at the Canadian border, and there's a bunch of mosquitoes out here. <laughs> um, but um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how I feel about it. On one hand, I feel like super excited that we did it, that we set out to do something and we got it done, and it wasn't easy, and it was a ton of fun, but also grueling. And the days have been so long. We've had three or four, like 11 plus hour days of driving. You know, at the same time, I made some mistakes and my my Jeep <laughs> needs to go into the shop. And it was kind of hard, hard to wrap my mind around that it would be like so long. I think we're on like day 13. When we get to our destination, we feel exhausted, but during the time, for the most part, you'd feel just like exhilarated because you're in such new and beautiful country. The scope of our public lands is so vast and I, this trip made me realize that, how important they are and what a treasure they are to Idaho and to other states that have them as well. And I found myself just recording like tons of stuff, even though it'll probably all look the same because, you know, trees and mountains, you know, they tend to just kind of run together after a while. But mostly I feel gratitude, gratitude that this exists, we have this public land that, that we can drive 1,400 miles through Idaho on dirt roads. We were really lucky to um, have our families join us for a little bit. And um, I am thankful that my kids weren't there the entire time. It would have been just um, too much for them. My only regret is that Kate's not here to share it with me, that she couldn't come for the whole trip, but I'm so grateful that she got to be there for part of it. And she got to drive some really fun, difficult sections. But I'm so thankful to have this journey and so thankful to be able to share it with my best friend. This was a lot of fun, but I am ready to go. So that's, that's the other good piece is that I'm ready to go. But I'm also a little sad that the adventure's over because it was a, it was a great adventure. You know, put a check mark, it's off the bucket list. Um, but I'm also looking forward to many more adventures. And to be honest, I want to be with Kate and the kids. I have such a strong pull to go home that I don't really want to be out away from them any longer. I want to go, go back home and be with them and find ways to get them out here too. I miss them so much. I want to hold them and kiss them. And I'm sure they'll tell me how bad I stink and all that stuff, but who cares? So this is the end of this journey, but the beginning of many, many, many more. Distracting you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we just came out. What river is it? <laughs> See, they only had two in the store, so I couldn't get one for myself. There's a reason they only have two, so nobody wants to buy these. <laughs> we uh, keep saying we're gonna go to bed early, and then we get around the campfire. We had quite the adventure yesterday that was not expected. Oh, the camera! <laughs> so, yeah. So. Uh, no matter what you do, you cannot. You cannot recreate that. It's a perfect sunset too. It's like the perfect sunset too. <laughs>